And of course, sometimes uh, the profession perhaps needs to take some responsibility too. Uh, we can talk about what somebody called prescriptive promiscuity. See, when you have hypertension and you have seven minutes to take care of a patient, there's no time to give a health lecture to that person. And even if you did, they're not interested. Because you don't need a seven-minute health lecture. You need 30 hours of understanding before you can really implement it and make it part of your new lifestyle. Of course, we also have to recognize that uh, the fatal adverse drug reactions are responsible for almost 250,000 deaths, which means that 11% of all American deaths are related to prescribed medication side effects, which makes prescription drugs the number three or the number four cause of death in America today. I think we need to make some changes. Here's an article that came out recently by Stanford uh, researchers. They said, with the advent of direct-to-consumer advertising for pharmaceuticals and surgical procedures, cultural expectations of immediate simplistic solutions have been bolstered by consumerism and fully exploited to generate demand for therapies that are often marginally indicated and potentially unsafe. Doc, I want to have an answer right away. I don't have time to go to, health, to a lecture series. I need it now. I have a golf game in two days. And of course, the costs speak for themselves. We now recognize that 84% of our medical dollar in America is spent on chronic diseases, and we're basically impotent medically to modifying that epidemic. We need to do something else. Here you see the dramatic increase. And that's why the current medical approach to these chronic diseases is no longer sustainable. To give you some idea, we're spending twice as much as a society on medical care than the next country in line. And yet America is only number 50 in life expectancy. Something is not quite right. Let me summarize that for you by reading some well-put essay by Dr. Robert Allen. He said that in 1981, and what he said then is truer today than ever before, here it is, the village well was poisoned and people felt sick. The doctors, the nurses, the villagers all ran about buying new beds, giving medications, providing lifelong care for those permanently crippled and diseased people. They became very adept at treating the ill. They could find the medicine, they refined the medicines, they could discover new and stronger antidotes, they trained people to care for the sick, they built beautiful buildings to accommodate the chronically ill. Better treatment procedures were invented with marvelous mechanical devices. Emergency services were developed to a remarkable degree of efficiency. There never had been better medical care anywhere. But but the patients kept coming and coming and coming. And the statistics kept rising and rising and rising. For no one treated the source of the problem, the poison well. And then he says, our cultures are poisoned wells today. They do not encourage people to be healthy. Even our medical system is not a health-promoting one. It is a disease care system that focuses on our illness after the damage has been done. We really practice today patch-up medicine, he says. We spend billions for surgery, for coronary care units, for kidney dialysis machines, for radiation therapy and chemical treatments for cancer. It all has become very lopsided. And our efforts and our money go to treat the results of our illness culture. Researchers produce new chemicals and radiation techniques trying to treat the tumor-filled lungs of smokers on their way to death. Millions are spent for immaculate, intricate, expensive, electronically monitored, technically refined coronary care units for the heart attack victims whose bad eating or smoking habits, stressful lifestyles, 
or lifelong lack of exercise brought them to the crisis. We try to repair and restore the bodies of the accident prone. We buy crutches for the crippled. We give tranquilizers to the stressed. We provide artificial hearts and hips and kidneys for those whose bodies have broken down. We have looked at disease so long until we have become blinded and forgotten about health. But we spend very little for the kind of care that will keep people well in the first place. Lifestyle medicine promotes a new concept. Lifestyle medicine proposes to help you to change, but it involves education, motivation, and inspiration to turn the epidemic around. So what's what's involved? What is behind this? Well, let's go a little deeper. We begin to see the change in our society, especially as we have shifted to a different kind of a diet. Just to give you some idea, uh, we have shifted from potatoes to Pringles. We've shifted from oats to Oreos. We've shifted from corn to Doritos. We've shifted from eating at home to eating out. We have shifted from beans to burgers and from water to soft drinks. It has all become lopsided. In the process, we have seen a dramatic shift in the diet composition. This is, a, this is perhaps the most important uh, slide this morning for you to understand the change in the diet and the effect that it has on chronic disease. On the left-hand side here, you see this is perhaps the uh, diet composition of a poor farmer in China or poor farmer in Mexico. You see, most of the calories come from the green bar, which represents starch. This is unrefined starch. This is called unrefined complex carbohydrate foods. These are beans and potatoes and uh, corn, these kind of things, right? Starchy foods, unrefined, with lots of fiber, inexpensive, healthy. But the farmer in China and the farmer in Mexico, he wants to live like Americans. He sees it on the screen. He sees it in the films. And so he shifts. He makes those changes. He goes to the big city, and now he adopts the American lifestyle. And what happens now is when you look at a diet that consists of burgers and Oreos and M&Ms and cakes and pies, what happens? Something happens, and that is the amount of fat dramatically increases. It goes from probably 10% to 40%. That's the American diet, which is about 35% now. The sugar consumption goes dramatically up. Again, you see about 15 to up to 20% of the calories now come from sugar. Very little nutrition value there. And then you look at the amount of protein that has gone up because they no longer eat protein from plant sources, but now the protein comes from largely animal sources, and so you have a significant increase in particular animal protein. With that, you have more saturated fat, you have more cholesterol, and so on, and also you have much, much less fiber in this kind of a diet than you have here. So these macronutrients drive the micronutrients. Where the energy comes from, the calories come from, drives where the nutrition is. Whenever you have this kind of a shift and you move towards this kind of a diet, ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you as an epidemiologist, you will always find the American diseases. You will always have to combat the Western diseases, period. It happens within five to ten years. I was in China years ago. It was difficult to find coronary disease. Today, it's there. And, of course, you also have all the American fast foods and everything else there. The American way is the American way of death. Let me give some uh, a little bit more insight here. The amount of sugar consumption, the trends in our society, today we probably consume 30 teaspoons per person per day. And people say that's impossible. Not really, especially when you realize that one-third of the sugar comes today from soda drinks. And, of course, there's some other things that, uh, you know, we kind of uh, feast on. I always tell my uh, participants, my patients, I said, I want you to really look at this donut from an anatomical perspective. Take a close look at it, and then always select the center, and you'll be okay. (laughs) 
These are the kind of foods, 25 teaspoons of sugar in a banana split, and then you look at potato chips. I mean, I can take one tube of Pringles, and I ask my medical students, how long does it take you to eat those? They debate this, and they say, sir, 13 minutes. I said, how many calories? We don't know. We don't take nutrition in medical school. I said, I understand. So 30 minutes, 1,100 calories. That's one-third of a pound of fat on your torso in 13 minutes. Then I asked them, now, how many potatoes could you have eaten? You know, if you wanted to have 1,120 calories in real potatoes, real food. I said, sir, we don't know. We don't take nutrition. I said, I understand. I said, let me tell you, it's going to be 11 potatoes. And then I asked them, how long would it take you to eat those 1,120 calories? And they say 11 days. <clears throat> but you know, they're also liquid calories. And sometimes people in America have the idea that liquid calories don't count. You have one of these, <laughs> one of these, what do you call this here? Yeah, it's, it's a large milkshake, right? That's 2,000 calories. That's more than a woman should have for the whole day in total food intake. And say, oh, I didn't know. That counts too? It was just a little snack. Yeah. The larger the snacks, the larger the slacks. <laughs> and then when you begin to add it all up, you begin to realize that about 45%, almost 50% of the calories we eat today in America have no nutritional values. These are called empty calories. They're stripped calories. They're naked calories. Look at it. But it's not only those calories that are devoid of nutrition, but there are some other areas where you also have to be very careful. Let me give you another, another example. But before I go there, let me point out one of the most important books that's currently much in discussion called Salt, Sugar, and Fat. How many of you have seen this book? That's one of the most important books. It is must-reading. Because in this book... Uh, the uh, award-winning author takes you behind the scenes and helps you to understand that most of the processed foods today are produced by large companies that many times are owned by Philip Morris, the tobacco giant. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think that Philip Morris understands something about addiction? <laughs> Guess what they do? They have large, they contract with large laboratories where hundreds of PhDs are studying the effect of salt, sugar, and fat on the pleasure centers of the brain. And they know exactly how many the amounts of salt, sugar, and fat to have in a product like M&Ms, Oreos, potato chips, so that you can never just eat one. Are you with me? Because within nanoseconds, the taste fibers send a message to the brain, this is good stuff. This is like a soft heroin trip. Go for it. You have to more. That's why people cannot eat just one M&M. You cannot eat just one Pringle. You cannot eat one Dory. You've got to have more. Are you with me? Yeah. Eat, drink, and die. And while some people are so concerned about moving towards a diet that has less meat, I would like to help us to balance that and say, yes, that's very important. That's very important. But this is also important to begin to understand that processed foods have their own area of great concern for health and for everything else. Are you with me? The book, Salt, Sugar, and Fat. Let me just read to you here uh, in the introduction. This meticulously, now this is not just some kind of a conspiracy theory book. This is not just a book that was written because I need to write a book and have some royalties coming in. This is a concerned writer, um, uh, an outstanding journalist. He, the, the, the introduction says, This meticulously researched book tells the chilling story of how a processed food industry is making a fortune by slowly poisoning an unwitting population. Suicide by the bite. 
But it's not just the fat and the oil and the grease that you have in these products, but it's also found in animal products. For instance, did you know that a half chick box of extra crispy is equivalent of 18 pats of butter? Surprise? Surprise? What did I say? Chick. Chicken. Oh. You must be vegetarians here. Yeah. Go to the corner and find out what they have there. Now, take a look. Where does most of the fat comes from in the American diet? Most of it comes from meat, poultry, and fish, 35%. Then you have salad oil and shortenings. And then you have dairy products, another 15%. This is where most of the fat comes from. And every gram of fat, as you know, has nine calories. And every gram of starch has only four calories. So if you want to lose weight, be careful about fatty oily, greasy foods. But look at the meats. Here you see spare ribs that's 80% fat. 80% of the calories in spare ribs is fat. You take a sirloin steak, and you say, well, but, you know, I'm, uh, I'm trimming my fat off. So you go from 75% down to maybe 59% because the fat is within these muscle layers that you cannot get at. So meat is a number one source of fat and in the American diet.